we three men are back in the shed again, like we often are, like we probably feel like we never leave. The reason for that is it's a lot of fun. So stick with us. We're here to have a bunch of fun again. Hopefully you do too. I don't even know what we're going to talk about. This and that, as always. Wide open to suggestions. If you got any, send us an email. Okay, so let's uh, just have a quick talk about uh, turkeys. Let's talk turkey. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this year during, uh, I think it was for the Christmas turkey this year, there was a pandemic shortage of turkeys. Do you guys recall that? I do not. I was gifted a turkey that I didn't want, so... I didn't I witness the shortage. I heard about it, but I... Yeah, so Sue... I did not experience Sue it. went out turkey shopping and could not find a frozen one. And uh, that oh. was well in advance of Christmas, I guess. So she actually went back to the stores a few times, and then as Christmas was approaching, the dinner was approaching, she decided that she had to buy a pre-stuffed turkey. You guys ever buy a pre-stuffed Ooh. turkey? Hundred, hundred, done it a whole bunch. Never of times. even heard of pre stuffing. Yeah, we, there, yeah, awesome. we'd never heard of it either. And uh, Sue's stuffing is uh, remarkably good, so you know we kind of want to avoid it for that reason. But she was forced into it. So fifty-five bucks later, she's got herself a pre-stuffed turkey, frozen. Frozen. So, uh, yep. so as as is our practice, you know, I think about a day before it's time to cook, out comes the turkey. Now I know. I know you're supposed to just leave it in the fridge and let it thaw in the fridge. We don't do that completely. We actually pull it out and let it thaw. As long as it still feels a little bit frozen on the outside, then I feel it's even more frozen on the inside. So uh, listeners don't do this at home, but it's something that we always do. So anyway, here it is. Okay, now it's, uh, you know, once it's thawed a little bit, it still feels almost frozen on the outside, then back in the fridge it goes for safety reasons. So we're good. And then we let it kind of thaw a little bit more and then pull it out. And now it's time to cook. So it's 2 p.m. Got to start the turkey. Out it comes. And she sees something on the label, which is, do not thaw this turkey. Cook from frozen. What? That's why I get them. You don't have to think. You just keep it in the freezer. You yank it out in the day. You soak the label off it and you stick it in the oven for like, 18 hours or whatever it takes and you're good wow i have never heard of that yeah Yeah, they they, they work really well that said we knew that it would probably work fine but we weren't gonna do it because the last thing you want to go through turkey dinner (laughs) thinking boy this tastes great sure hope we don't get sick (laughs) you know you don't want (laughs) to well and plus there's this big bolus of frozen stuffing inside they're like how (laughs) how do you figure out whether it's even thawed on the inside i just don't know yeah that's true like you either cook it from fresh or you cook it from frozen but you would be starting from sort of halfway probably yeah Uh, yeah yeah yeah. so who knows right so so that was a turkey that made its way into the i believe it was a compost was where it ended up a whole turkey the whole business 55 bucks were just gone right because there's nothing nothing we could do really and we didn't want to donate it because then you're basically oh we might get poisoned but we're so we'll just donate it then so but but why didn't you cook it because it said don't thaw this thing you have to cook it from frozen and it's for safety reasons So you just stuck it into your compost, and I'm wondering if this is a natural segue into your follow-up rat story. We kept it refrigerated right until it was time to wheel the compost out, (laughs) if that helps. So so that's uh, just somewhere else. Yeah, okay. That does help, actually. Wow, that's too bad, though. That really is a pity. But she headed right out to the store and found a fresh one. Supply yeah, chain. and because so, it was fresh, you know, it's not frozen in the least. Because usually when you defrost, there's kind of, you don't really know if it's fully defrosted, if you know what I mean. Whereas if you buy it yeah, fresh, it's yes, definitely which, defrosted. And and sure enough, yeah. I think we were eating by 6.30 or 7. So it all worked out in the yeah. end. What about those rats, RJ? You had a rat story follow-up. I've been, every time I look at our list, I think, I wonder what's going on. Yeah, we got rat rats. follow-up. Uh, Are they happy? I guess in the last episode, we had heard the sound of tiny little feet in our ceiling, in our utility room, (laughs) skittering about. I'm not sure how much of this I related last time, but we basically had the the exterminator come out. He was excellent to deal with, kind of pricey 
especially if it was like $500 for them to put a box with a whole bunch of river rock in it into our soil and with some uh, steel mesh at the bottom and side of the box, so the little rodents. I'd have done that for 300 Archie. <laughs> but uh, we were just like in a hurry, so we were throwing money at the problem. <laughs> Absolutely. When, yes, with Hannah Roman gave us all money. kinds of warnings about how fast that mice in particular replicate. And uh, what's the name of the uh, bad disease that uh, mice, yeah, Anto- antivirus, which antivirus. it turns out is very uncommon in roof rats, which is what we had, but doesn't matter. Yes, roof, roof rats. rats, yes. Mm-hmm. Roof rats. So there's rink rats, <laughs> exactly. roof rats, and just rats. Yeah, they're, like, they're wow, hanging out dude. up there, smoking cigarettes, roof rats. and looking looking shifty. So are we going to have to refrain from demolishing abandoned neighborhoods because it's the natural habit of the habitat of the endangered roof rat? Like, what the hell? Roof rats. Do they have different coloring? <laughs> They eat only popcorn? I anyway, what, he caught a couple wow. of them with those newfangled plastic rat traps, although he did have some wooden ones as well. And those things are just, I find those scary. I don't want to deal with them. Yeah, we traumatized our listeners last time with a, we made sure that everybody understood what is meant by humane in the context of rat traps Immediate. these days. <laughs> yeah, yes. instantaneous. Didn't know what hit them. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Instead of, you know, trapped and flown 400 miles into the wilderness and released into a little meadow with flowers and bees. <laughs> yeah, because we, you know, when we first started dealing with them, we were saying things like eco-friendly and humane, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then it was, what? Just kill them. They're in my he's attic. Going, he's going, yeah, they have, by regulation, they all have to be eco-friendly now. Anyway, I guess they're not allowed to use those in the home. Uh, so what's the update? Came out a couple times more, and uh, there was one more rat, and then uh, he did the full uh, hantavirus cleanup, which to me was no longer about the virus so much because I wasn't worried about that, but I didn't want to get up there on my hands and knees vacuuming up rat poop, so he took care of all that. But all in, though, I think, what was it? Like the cleanup was 150 the initial appointment was three or 400 and those rocks was 500 So we are looking at 1200 bucks for two rats, Jeez. 600 bucks per rat. I guess the cleanup... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you should ask for the skins yeah, and right. make gloves or something you know like salvage something out of this whole thing uh, that's what i spent on cashy who might have eaten rat poison you know that somebody but uh i guess if he does the cleanup it's it's like a sweep too he's up there and he has a real good hard look to make sure nobody got yeah that's paste. right he, he had to pull aside the uh, insulation that's kind of not the entire roof it's just the part of the garage roof that's near our house so maybe two feet or yeah. one foot wide and so he pulled that out um so i, th- I think we're good now that's a lot of money eh? that's but <laughs> yeah you better be good for that kind of money there is a hobbesian choice you can either spend that money or have rats <laughs> there you, you go know? you're, you're <laughs> hobson's <laughs> choice i should say <laughs> it's good to go full circle on these things that's what you get here with the shed docs you know you get conclusion it's and because nice. we were talking about the terminator movie let's try and uh <laughs> let's try and speaking of dead into rats. uh reacher oh yeah yeah i want to hear right what because pj we know that you're a big uh reacher fan from the books is that fair to say yeah i've every read every single books, one yes. and there's like 27 yeah. or something like that i don't know there's a whole mm-hmm. bunch and yes to save everyone the trouble i get these are not literature <laughs> right and uh have you seen the uh series I think our man Tom made two or three Reacher movies, which I have seen. However many he's made, right. I've and seen. before you go on from that, Lee Child did not like those movies, correct? Yeah, he, I don't know. And uh, no well, Lee Child, Child is the author, is. and the author does not like those. Why? Because Tom Cruise is nothing like the character in terms of his physical attributes. What do you mean? He's five six and weighs about one hundred and sixty well, pounds. What's yeah. the difference? Like in the book, he's six five and weighs two eighty. <laughs> I mean, what's the difference? Tom's a spectacular actor, so you just won't. And you know, although I'm trying to be funny here, the truth is, I thought Tom was pretty credible as a bruiser kind of a guy. He is not. Like, no matter how credible a job he did as a tough guy, and it was pretty good, I thought, honestly. He's, he's in the book, Jack Reacher is right. just a monster. Well, in just this TV series, monster. he's 250 pounds 
and uh, super muscular yeah. and everything. So, PJ, have you seen part of the series yet? I've seen clips oh. uh, on social media. I've seen clips of various fight scenes. I didn't even know it was a TV series. Yes. Is it? So we have, it's on Amazon Prime, which we accidentally subscribed to. And we know that it's coming to an end in, I think, five days. So we thought, <laughs> oh, okay, well, is there anything on there? We go, oh, Reacher. And so. we particularly remembered about that you read the books. And, uh, you know, mm. we like the Tom Cruise movies as well, but I, uh, they're forgettable to me. All those kind of action stuff's forgettable. I couldn't have told you anything about them but yeah uh yeah this uh tv series is great we've only watched one or two episodes and uh just really satisfying fun to watch i think two episodes we've seen yeah are they careful to have him come across as smart yeah really Cause, smart because that's the most appealing thing about the books is he's smart. he's smart and fast and he points things out to the local police and including like where the guy went to university <laughs> you know he figures out that the guy went yeah. to harvard he goes yeah. yeah you're you know you're you talked about bean town so that's how i figured out that you went to school and uh, and, and you went to harvard because blah 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 and it's all it's all quite yeah. credible too. The dialogue's very good and yeah. the action scenes are great. Oh, good. Well, I'll have to. I didn't realize it was serious. I think I still have Amazon Prime also, so I will have to look at that because that'll be fun. Yeah, I know. It's part and parcel. Part and parcel. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> man! Fire. Just fire every day of my uh, subscription canceling problem. <laughs> uh, I think the character development's really good. The uh, characters themselves are good. The local town policy, everything about it. I really, it's a nice little show to watch. You got any info on how Lee Child felt about the TV Yes, he series? likes it. Yeah, oh, that's okay. the story. Good. Yeah. All right. So that's Reacher. So um, speaking about action uh, series, I've been watching, you may have heard this series popular back in the 80s. I'm not sure how well known it was called Magnum P.I., For many of our listeners who weren't born then, who weren't born until like 10 years after that series ended, should look it up like RJ did. It's, it's a lot of fun. Tells you a lot about the social climate of the day. When we were creeping around on all fours in the fog of time, that's what it was I don't like. think I ever watched a whole episode of Magnum P.I. back in the 80s. Really? Uh, really? Next you're going to tell me you watched a whole bunch of, uh, you know, moving on up. <laughs> to jefferson's how about you kj did you watch magnum back in the day so i'd go by i don't, I don't remember wouldn't it have been before. considered a little bit uncool in our in our friend group maybe what what are the years we're talking 1981 about? probably to 89 or 90 because i think they did nine seasons oh well then no no i missed tv after 1980 i watched it i didn't watch it sort of religiously faithfully but i did watch it i think i watched it in in i don't know if syndication is still a term that's even used but i don't think i watched it when it was new i think i watched it in reruns somewhere i i have no idea why i started watching magnum pi again i think i started three weeks ago or something i don't know why why, why would i do that nobody knows been totally enjoying it though it's on uh listeners if you want to watch magnum pi it's on ctv.ca you just go to that web page and you don't even have to prove that you have cable or anything. They just let you watch it. There are no commercials. It's it's really? high def and they didn't pull that stupid stunt where they crop the top and the bottom to force it to be widescreen. So it's a nice four by three ratio. It's the original ratio, like the old TVs. Who's our, who's, who's our star in okay, Magnum It PI? is uh, Tom Selleck. Uh, oh. And it was Tom Selleck's first big role. I think he'd been in a little bit of theater or whatever before that. Tom Selleck himself had been in the military, not the Navy, but I think he'd been in the Army. And th this, many of the plots in this show are either directly or indirectly related to Vietnam. It's set in Hawaii, which he pronounces well. I do a bad, pro it's supposed to be Hawaii, something like that, right? Like, and he's, he seems to say it right. He seems to do a good job of that. Isn't it a V? The W is a V, Hawaii. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Hawaii, uh, something like, yeah. He, so he, those actor guys, they know, they know stuff. their stuff. I worked with Tom. Me Did Tom you really? Like so how, so how was Tom? What was he like? He was fabulous. What yeah. was it on? I don't know. We were lawyers. I remember I bought the suit from the film. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. 
You could IMDB it, though. Okay, mm-hmm. will do. The only thing he did other than that that I ever remember is Quigley Down Under, <laughs> which involves him being a rancher from Australia coming to America, and he's got a long rifle that he's an incredibly good shot with, and that's all I remember. Yeah, well, you know, you would think that Magnum P.I. was, uh, he's certainly most well-known for it, but you would think that that was the thing he was longest in. But no, he currently is star in Blue Bloods, and that has been on for longer than Magnum P.I. ever was by a few years. What's Blue Bloods? Is that a soap or something? Uh, It's, let me see here, since 2010, Selleck has co-starred as New York City Police Commissioner Frank Regan in the series Blue Bloods. And it's been renewed for its 12th season. And so wow. he's the commissioner. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the plot. So I, you know, I treat. So here's the thing about Magnum P.I. I get into this zone. I think I've become my parents, right? Like my parents used to, when they were older, they would sit and watch all these low risk TV shows. You know, all the ones where by the end of the episode, everything's going to be fine. There's no arc that adds tension throughout a season. It's It's all good. It's a real palate cleanser of a show, you know, like you just watch it and you feel good. You enter in though the world's a simpler place. You forget all about COVID, you know, just every, everything's good. So yeah, it's total escapism and it's, and it's Hawaii. <laughs> Sorry. I know I'm butchering that. I'm just going to say Hawaii like I did when I was a kid, but, uh, yeah. And, and of course, Sue and I have only been there once and we decided to go to Oahu for our first visit and that's where it's largely set. So the scenery is fantastic. You got your, uh, the basic premise is that Thomas and his buddies, TC and Rick were all together in the same unit in Nam, and they're all now in, uh, Hawaii. They're friends. The, uh, Magnum is a PI private investigator. People call him a private eye and he always corrects them. No, no, I'm a private investigator. And there's, there's no end of these little reference sticks. Like, you know, when someone calls him a private eye, you know, what's coming, you know, you get a little grin on your face. You go, this is what he tells him. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Oh man. Do you have in your house already a leather recliner couch? Like one of those ones where you pull a lever and I, the thing comes up and you your know, legs are stretched I totally out? should. I watched in the office. Do you have a Snuggly? <laughs> you probably got one of those. That's right. <laughs> so you got his buddies. Uh, many of the plots are, you know, center around their history in Vietnam. You know, somebody that they knew in the war comes and visits Hawaii and there's some kind of action that... Thomas helps them typically, but anyway, the character's awesome. The, the, the other main character I haven't mentioned yet is Higgins. Mm. Oh yeah. That's yeah, the yeah, guy yeah, I was trying yeah. to think. I know there's the guy that flies the helicopter. The helicopter's all over the place, but I couldn't remember that starchy guy. Right, right. And he's, yeah. his, I, I remember. Yeah. Higgins. And he's yeah. Uh, he's British upper crust. He's always telling war stories and he's very snooty. And turns out he's played by a guy named uh, John Hillerman, the Emmy-winning John Hillerman. He got an Emmy for his work in Magnum. John Hillerman is from Texas. So that's kind of cool really? because he does such a great job as a kind of snooty British guy. And so he was in uh, a lot of Peter Bogdanovich films, like The Last Picture Show, What's Up Doc. He was in Paper Moon. So as a sidebar, I decided to watch Paper Moon. That's a fantastic movie. KJ, if you want to, you know, up viewership of anything you've ever been in, just start mentioning them on here. Because evidently for RJ, it just has to get mentioned. A little brain worm goes in there and three days later, he's pulling the lever to raise his feet and he's watching whatever it was, you know, like. Just... <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, those Peter Bogdanovich is a great director anyway. So Paper Moon's good. And, and John Hillerman plays a moonshiner who, uh, you know, in Paper Moon, it's a father daughter team who are grifters. Right. And so mm. they cheat the moon. Ryan yeah. Ryan O'Neill and his daughter Tatum O'Neill. And they, they cheat the moonshiner by stealing his whiskey and selling it back to him. And that's when the moonshiner's brother gets involved, who's the sheriff. And that's also John Hillerman. And uh, so it's great. The sheriff goes ahead and chases him across state lines. Doesn't matter. The sheriff doesn't care about that stuff. And uh, anyway, Hillerman's good. Hillerman, you know, back to his character Higgins, 
Higgins can't stand Magnum at first. In fact, in the first six episodes or so, they just Higgins just hates him. It's really kind of. But uh, later on, they get a grudging respect for each other. What, what is? I can't remember what he was supposed to be. Is he a butler, a groundskeeper, a landlord? What what is he in? There? Right. Well, yeah. There, so he is kind of like the groundskeeper for a famous author and super rich author, Robin Masters. And oh, uh, wow, I yeah, they, they got an estate yeah, there yeah. in Oahu near Waikiki. And, uh, yes. and, uh, and he's buddies with Magnum and that's why Magnum lives Magnum there. Magnum gets hired as the security specialist for the estate. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty funny because Higgins is constantly wow. sicking the two Dobermans on him, on Magnum, Apollo and Zeus. <laughs> whenever, whenever Higgins kind of pulls a stunt that's going to put Thomas in trouble of some kind, Higgins gets this little grin on his face. <laughs> it's just quite funny. He kind of reminds me of that uh, cartoon dog that's always laughing. Yeah. Anyway, the the plots are often predictable. <laughs> um, there's some bits that happen every so you get the familiarity of the bits. You know, anytime Thomas needs help from his buddies, TC, who's a helicopter pilot. TC always says no. Why? Because Thomas owes him a whole bunch of money. Thomas is always struggling for money, right? And so TC says no, and Thomas ultimately, ultimately makes some kind of little speech that pulls at TC's heartstrings because this client, who is typically a woman, really needs some help. So the next thing you know, TC's helping him, flying him somewhere in his helicopter. <laughs> At extremely high speeds, by the way, and just over the ocean. Like, I was watching that, and I'm going, that's crazy. That's dangerous. Like, they're going really fast. The camera angle makes it look like they're just 10 feet over the ocean at full speed. I'm sure that it's more like 40 or 50 feet. And then... It's because he's an experienced Marine. Right, but then I saw, like, I noticed that, and then I saw at the end of the fourth episode, it says, in memory of, this episode in memory of, right? So I Google that. Turns out that it's the stunt chopper pilot died like in the fourth or fifth episode in an epi- in in an event that was related to flying too close to the ocean wow so he duffed it yeah wow. yeah so i'm not sure about the details but but that's what they specifically said because yeah, i do remember that in the opening credits they would show that helicopter flying just zooming along just above the water with an island in the yeah. background so and there's watch tropical paradise there's no point to it i understand that if they're trying to get out a radar or something that you would do that but they just do it when there's no point to it i think i think if you're hopping from island island which is the whole reason that they use the helicopter you would basically get up to i don't know at least 500 feet anyway there's no no point to yeah yeah Yeah, hawaii might be an island paradise and everything but i'm pretty sure they have you know air traffic control and i'm pretty sure they don't approve of you just zooming along the wave tops day after day after yep. day. So TC's real name is Theodore Calvin. That's where TC comes from. And the other friend is uh, Rick. Rick is named Rick because he's patterned after Rick from Casablanca. He runs the uh, little club there. I just can't believe all the stuff that I'm remembering as he goes through this. I remember that guy's face too, that guy Rick. Yeah, he's still alive and pushing his book about uh, Tom Selleck. <laughs> And Chubby Checker's out there doing the twist. It's all the same thing, eh? So you got uh, Rick, patterned after uh, Rick from uh, the Café American in Casablanca. And uh, Rick's name is Orville Wilbur Richard Wright. So Orville Wright. And he's just another buddy. Anyway, the bits, that they have all kinds of bits. And so that, that that's what provides, you know, your viewer comfort is that every episode they're going to have similar things happening. Yeah. And, and, you know, modern shows are often super fast paced, right? Like things happen, you know, if it's one of those FBI type shows, the clues come on about two clues every minute, you know, and the change of scenery and, you know, it's hut, hut, hut running along the ground. Next thing you know, they're blasting into someplace. Claire, Claire. And then, oh, there's the body. Okay. You know, this all happens so fast, but the, these older shows, they, they're more paced. And I actually like that. Like they'll do these long bits like Higgins purposefully. He's uh, typing his memoir, reading lovingly his own words about what, you know, something that happened in some war while in, well, Burma. in Burma. And Thomas is out there being chased by the dogs, you know, yelling, Higgins, Higgins. <laughs> and, you know, that would be it in a modern show. That would be funny. And they'd move on. But this one, no, 
you know, you just get to watch for a good 90 seconds. <laughs> Higgins just keeps typing and reading, lovingly reading his memoirs. You know, like, it's pretty fun, actually. Well, it's fun that Thomas is constantly broke, but he's roaring around in that Ferrari. Yeah, well, that's Robin yeah. Masters' Maybe. Ferrari. Oh, I forgot. Yes, yes. I forgot. And he's constantly... Oh, so he's constantly begging, begging for, for gas money. And another one of the yeah. bits is him and Higgins are constantly negotiating. Like, if either of them needs the other's help... There's some negotiating involved about privileges around the estate, like use of the car, use of the tennis courts, this and that. Now, technically, the camera nice. work, sometimes really good, sometimes really bad, and in particular, like the zoom shots. For some reason, maybe they couldn't afford a good zoom lens. So anytime that we're seeing something from afar, like uh, some activity on a ship, they're super grainy. The ADR work, which is the work where they have to re-record dialogue, really really bad you know they'll be in the chopper and there'll be a wine and then all of a sudden there's no wine at all because they're doing the adr work <laughs> the and they didn't over, keep yeah. those in separate channels or anything so they just yeah you know, we're, we're familiar with that problem here in i think we dogs. i think we're we do better work on uh on this <laughs> podcast that's um treatment of race because nowadays it seems like race has to be referred to constantly not always but i kind of like that i think it's realistic in that if you live in a place like hawaii and you have friends that are black or japanese or indigenous you're not going to be constantly saying things about race and uh and so that's that's a relief on the other hand sometimes they decide to go all in and then it's caricature level right like so they got the the japanese wow. woman whose husband leaves her and now she's going to commit seppuku so they got to go full in to the culture or or not at all and uh, but uh anyway like i say it's uh it's largely pretty good also because there's lots of references to the vietnamese war they don't do the thing that you might have seen more in the 60s or 70s where the Vietnamese would be considered, you know, inherently evil because they're foreigners, right? No, it's not like that at all. In fact, if anybody's inherently evil in Magnum PI, it's any brass, any senior military mm. people are almost always bad. <laughs> and so, so are you going to wade through the whole nine years? Are you going to spend, is it going to be like midsummer when we get the final, you know, did he marry Higgins at the end? Is that how the series? I may or may not run out of steam. I mean, one it's of the things be... that's carried me through it is that there's a, a podcast called Magna, the Magnum podcast. And so it's kind of fun. You watch an episode and then you get to Jeez. listen to it discussed. Oh. But you're running out of time with Amazon, aren't you? No, this one's ctv.ca. So Oh, 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 that was yeah. a different one. I wonder if there's any podcasts out there discussing our podcasts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Probably. Did you see 131 where they talked? It was kind of wild. Did you hear the stuff they said about yeah. Beethoven? What's the matter with those guys? They're usually way yeah, better. They probably that. have like 10,000 listeners. <laughs> that, that's funny. Um, so we got uh, the guy that created it was Donald P. Belisario and almost all of his shows are related to the military and uh, so he himself of course was in the military like Magnum was anyway uh, Airwolf Quantum Leap JAG NCIS all those are military type shows like shows from that age although I think this was starting to come to an end in the 80s consent doesn't seem to be a factor in kisses magnum pi will just you know there will be a scene right and uh it's clear that the two of them suddenly want to kiss each other so that's fine but sometimes it's like thomas just leans in for a kiss the woman melts it's kind of disgusting actually and in some cases he he go in one case he actually kisses her and from that from the way she kissed him she can tell now he tells that he can trust her it's just like anyway <laughs> makes no sense but I don't want to end on that low note but that's the end of my notes it's a fantastic show to watch it's really fun give it a try early episodes are kind of weird but fun anyway and it just gets better and better so I'm in season two right now and uh, it's pretty good stuff that was good thank you for that. And listeners, let us know how you uh, how you find that, because I know that you'll be rushing out. I had the thing I wanted to ask you guys, your best stories about foolish candor. I just wondered, you know, they start thinking about all the times when you have misunderstood where somebody else is at, and you've said something to them that you may deeply regret. And Well, I have one, it's sort of, because I'm in Victoria, we were here um, in 1980. 
83, two or three, doing a show. We were doing Midsummer Night's Dream at the Bastion. I think it was the opening night party. One of the board of directors' wives, or maybe it was she was on the board of directors, her, her name was Inez, but I think it was spelled A N E Z. It's, it's really a, you know, a, a snooty tooty party that it's some fabulous residence. And I, I see this guy and I go up to him and I said, because for some reason I had this, in, I had spelling in my head and I, I said, oh, you're Anus's husband, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it just like, in a, you know. And, <laughs> uh, and then was, was anything said to defuse the situation or? No, I think I realized it as soon as it came out of my mouth, and I just kind of turned and went, oh, Jesus, and then walked away. <laughs> he was on the ferry home the next day. Tour over. <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, dad, dad, dad. Good forever. I did have one more, actually, on the list. Uh, my new favorite product. I don't know if you guys went and looked at the link that I was provided there. Uh, no, because I didn't see that no, till well, now. Have so. a little look, and listeners, you may also. My new favorite product is called Liquid Death. And it comes in tall cans, and it's got sort of a skull and crossbones themed labeling thing on it. And what it is is water. It's <laughs> just water. So some guy somewhere, some kind of environmental activist type guy who wanted to make a few bucks, discovered that plastic water bottles are only like 3% of them are recycled, and 3% of the material that goes out as plastic bottles comes back as anything else, whereas 70% of aluminum comes back. So... He decided he would start selling water in aluminum tins because it was more environmentally fr friendly. Yeah, for and sure. And then he decided that he needed to make it more appealing. So he, he called it liquid death <laughs> and he did all these, the link is to a video of one of their first commercials and they just make it sound super sinister, you know, and there's, you, you've seen the energy drinks with those really kind of skull and yeah. crossbone lightning bolt type things. And right. He marketed it all like that, right? And it's is really funny. He contributes a bunch of his profits to environmental causes and stuff. And I'm given to understand that if you are trying to not drink or or have that in your hand at a party and everybody's, whoa, what are you drinking? Jeez. You know, <laughs> wow, it's liquid death. That's a great idea. It's it's not just the recycling rate. It's also way easier to recycle aluminum than plastic as well. But but that's I mean related. Uh, starting February first, you guys are probably aware are uh, all the milk, milk cartons. cartons. Yeah, and that's really annoying. <laughs> For not the reasons that you guys think, though. I mean, we've been recycling milk cartons forever. We just crush them. We put them in our plastic recycling. And those things ultimately end up being park benches or something. They are, they're fairly recyclable. But now you have to have them full size and you got to take them down to the bottle depot or haul them back to the store you bought them in. You're not allowed to you know, crunch we, them all up? No, no. And we, we buy the, you know, cause I drink, you know, I know I shouldn't, but I drink uh, milk. 2% milk. Are you talking the, the and plastic I buy it. ones or oh, the, the, te the yeah. Tetra Packs? Yeah, yeah. Well, both of them. So the four liter plastic jugs that I buy, you have to recycle them too. Yeah, but if you put them in your recycling, the Chinese ladies will come along and take care of those. Yeah, well, once you've crushed them, they no longer, you no longer get your deposit back. Yeah, you're supposed to not crush them. That's the problem, right? So for us... Oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I know. I go through one of those every couple of weeks, and the next thing you know, I'm going to have like a great big plastic bag full of them. Yeah, only. your trunk would, or your car would be full in a month. Yeah, and then you bring it in, and you get like a dollar twenty back or something. Like, it's just... Anyway, the, I, the system will take care of that, RJ. Do you know whether or not the, like I said, Tetra Packs, but the way you're talking, it sounds like those plastic four liter jugs. It's so both. I don't know. It's both. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, so man. the Tetra Packs are the same. You got to rinse them out. And uh, now you, if you want your 10 cents back, you got to bring them in. So I wonder what the rationale for not crushing them is. Surely they're not just refilling those things. I think they can rinse them a lot more easily. Like you're supposed to rinse, but people don't. So I imagine uh, that the, one of the first thing that happens yeah. in the process is they get a kind of a little pair of arms come along, hold on to it, and the, the fluid uh, shoots inside yeah. to rinse them. 
Inconvenience will take care of that, I think. Right. And so I think because it's so little money in the big scheme of things, I think we'll just keep crushing ours. We we discussed it. We're going to fill one bag. <laughs> and then once that one bag's full, we're just going to crush them and recycle. So That's another question. If I, if I continue to crush them and just stick them in the recycle as I do now, they're not going to pick them out and say, you've got to recycle this. No, are they, or are I don't they? think so. I think they'll, I think that will okay. continue to go in the okay. recycling. So then the other thing is like what Moby's been saying. He's right about that. If you just leave them out uncrushed. Oh yeah. Ooh, somebody will take those babies. That's yeah, true. Absolutely. That's true. Yeah. Um, but I didn't realize that you couldn't crush them and that it annoys me because that's just a profit margin issue, right? Like it's just, yeah, you got to rinse them in it. Why? So the recycler doesn't have to do it. Well, is the recy- no, they're making money on it. Yes, they got to make money. Oh, are they actually doing anything? Are they are they environmentally friendly recyclers? I don't know, but we've got a contract with them. I don't like that part of the business business. That's the end of another fantastic, fabulous, educational, scintillating episode of The Shed Dogs. We hope you found at least one of those adjectives sort of possibly moderately applicable. Great. If you did, let us know. If you didn't, let us know. If you want to know what I'm even talking about, let us know. There's a message here. Be. And while you're pondering that, we'll sign off and wish you the best until the next video. See ya. Bye now. <laughs>